The story of Gideon that we just read, or that Maris just read for us, um, filled as it is with very difficult uh, people and place names. So no, I do not, I'm not angry at the lay readers. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry Maris, wherever you are, that you had to struggle through that. Um, but you did an excellent job, thank you. Uh, but that, that story that we read in our Old Testament lesson is a story of a man trying to understand what God is calling him to do. And the thing that I find so very, very interesting is not the laying out of the fleece one night to see if it will be wet while the ground is dry, and then again the next night to see if it will be dry and the ground around it wet, although that's a fascinating story. What I find so interesting is that Gideon wanted that twice, wanted both of those proofs that this is what God wanted him to do, after God had already told him in person, face to face, that it was what God wanted him to do. Then our New Testament lesson, also tells the story of people who are trying to discern God's will. The story in Acts picks up shortly after Jesus has been resurrected and then ascended into heaven. The disciples are fig trying to figure out what to do next. Jesus has instructed them to wait until the coming of the Holy Spirit. But in the meantime, they decide to go ahead and fill the vacancy in their ranks left when Judas betrayed Jesus and then committed suicide. So how do they make their decision? Do they hire a headhunting firm? Do they have a series of debates and a year-long process of uh, small town meetings and, and uh, elections and states? No, they cast lots. They cast lots. They played a game of chance. They drew straws, they rolled the dice, they pulled a name out of a hat with the outcome deciding who would be the 12th disciple. The actual process as described by William Barclay would have gone this way. He says the names of the candidates were written on stones. The stones were put into a vessel, and the vessel was shaken until one stone fell out. And he whose name was on that stone was elected to office. Now that was not the first time that the Bible tells us that apparently a game of chance was used to make a big decision. Saul, who was the first king of Israel, was chosen by Lot. The book of Joshua describes the apportionment of land to the different tribes of Israel by Lot. And sometimes guilt or innocence was determined by the casting of lots. How could such important decisions be left up to chance? Well, they weren't. See, people believed that what might appear to be chance was actually God working to make God's will known. The disciples in Acts were seeking God's will in their choice of an apostle to replace Judas. The stone with Matthias' name didn't just pop out by chance. God caused it to fall out. In the church, we're always trying to discern God's will. The question is not, what do we want to do next, but rather, what does God want us to do next? And as we struggle to answer that question, two of the stumbling blocks in our way can be our own egos and our own preferences. Do we like things just the way they are, even if that means never growing into the God's plan for our church? Or do we want to change everything, even if it means abandoning the very things that have made this church a strong and stable part of the body of Christ for a century? How do we discern what God would have us do and be, and do so in a way that clearly separates God's will from our own? Well, for those in the early church, it meant casting lots. The author of Acts tells us that the process was whittled down to two candidates who were considered viable by virtue of their having some basic qualifications. The author tells us that both had accompanied Jesus during all the time that the Lord went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us. So both had traveled with Jesus and heard him preach and teach. They had both known Jesus and witnessed his miracles of healing. They had both been a part of Jesus' life and ministry throughout his earthly time. And while this is the first time that we have heard their names, from the looks of it, these two have been actively involved in Jesus' life and ministry from behind the scenes, doing the work, but getting none of the glory. But when it comes to who should be the one, which should we choose? There were probably cases to be made on both sides. Maybe Matthias had always been the one to buy the bread for their meals, and Justice was the one who knew all the locals and could mobilize volunteers at a moment's notice. Maybe Matthias was the better fundraiser and preacher, but Justice had the better bedside manner and could say a prayer that would really knock your socks off. Maybe there was considerable debate among the eleven as to which of these would be number twelve. 
and since their group was an odd number, had they voted, barring a few abstentions, they would have been assured of choosing one or the other. But rather than rely on their own biases and preferences, they trusted fully that God would make a better selection than they could. So they cast lots, confident that God would pull out the stone that bore the name of the disciple of God's own choosing. Did it work? Well, the church has always believed that it did. God's will discerned in the rolling of dice or the drawing of straws? Well, maybe, maybe not. I doubt many people would feel comfortable making church decisions with a set of polyhedral gaming dice or by pulling names out of a hat. But the underlying principle remains the same. It is our duty and our responsibility as the church of Jesus Christ to move beyond what we want and what we would prefer and to find the things that God wants for us to do and be. This is also the principle that undergirds the way we do things in our Presbyterian tradition. When there are decisions to be made, we vote on it. But that doesn't mean that we're a democratic system. That's one of the big misperceptions people have about the Presbyterian church. Democracy is based on the principle of voting to determine the will of the people. But in the Presbyterian church, we vote as a way to determine the will of God. If you are of a certain age, then you probably grew up with schoolhouse rocks. I can recite the preamble to the U.S. Constitution by heart, but only if I sing it. <laughs> Schoolhouse Rock taught me that a noun is a person, place, or thing, and that three is a magic number. But it also taught me about how government works, in particular how a bill becomes a law. That poor little bill, just sitting there on Capitol Hill, gets bounced around from committee to committee and through both houses of Congress, only to be vetoed by the president and then the whole process starts all over again. And while that process can be reminiscent of the way that decisions get made in the Presbyterian Church, it's not quite the same. Here, we do make use of committees, and our session is a governing body made up of members elected to serve and charged with making decisions, sort of like Congress. But there, the similarities end. In the Presbyterian system, we prayerfully study and debate and discuss an issue, and then we pray and discuss it some more. When we finally cast our vote, every member of the body is asked to vote, not based on what he or she wants, but on what he or she believes God is calling them to do. That means that everyone's involved in the process, listening for an answer from God, and they're all trying to be faithful. After the votes are cast and counted, we agree to abide by the outcome. And while we don't know for sure if we have heard God correctly, through that process, we believe that what emerges is closer to God's will and further from error than what any one individual is likely to come up with on their own. We don't have a diocese making decisions for us or a bishop. Not even your minister is supposed to dictate what happens. Your ministers are here to help you, the congregation, listen for and discern God's will for the church. That means we put a lot of faith in people to listen for God's voice but it also means we put a lot of faith in God to speak to people. These are important things to keep in mind when we consider the future of our church. Today, we heard from the Appreciative Inquiry team as they presented their report based on data collected from members of the congregation. Through months of prayerful discussion and debate and carefully sifting through feedback gleaned from the membership, the team has reached a point where they can present four program goals for this church. They're asking you to prayerfully consider whether this is what God is calling Overbrook Church to do and be, and whether or not you may be called to be a part of it. You see, this is all an exercise in trying to understand what God would have us do and be. And if we aren't trying to live in obedience to God and seek God's will, well, really we're just another social club. So the key is trying to understand God's will. And if we are to know God's will, then we must first know God. Author and theologian Shirley Guthrie writes about what it means to know God. He says, to know God does not mean to know about God, to believe intellectually and grasp rationally that there is a God, to have information about God's attributes and will. To know God means to experience God, to have a personal relationship with God. To know God's judgment, for instance, is not simply to believe that there is a divine judge. It is to have God's judgment happen to you. To know God's love 
It's not just to believe in a theory of the love of God. It is to experience God's loving action. To know God is to acknowledge, confess, honor, thank, and serve God. How then can we do that? Well, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have, we have revealed for us the most perfect embodiment of what God is like. In Jesus' love and self-sacrifice, we see God revealed. In Jesus' living with the poor and with sinners, we see God revealed. In Jesus' concern for the hungry and the oppressed and the outcast, we see God revealed. Jesus not only talked about the coming of the kingdom of God's love, justice, and peace, he demonstrated the coming of the kingdom as he healed the sick, forgave sinners, and befriended the poor and excluded Jesus not only spoke about God's love, he himself loved with the love of God. This is the God we discover when we come to know God, really know God, and not just know about God. It is also God's tendency, as we learn from our shared scriptural story, to go against the grain from time to time, to zig when we might expect God to zag. God chose to build a nation through an elderly couple who were well beyond childbearing years, God chose to send a savior, not through the powerful families and nations of the world, but through an infant child of an unwed mother in a forgotten backwater town of a forgotten backwater corner of the Roman Empire. God chose to redeem the world, not through a powerful king ruling on an earthly throne, but through a suffering servant who died on a criminal's cross. Guthrie writes again, if we are to know God and God's self-revelation, we must be willing to hear and accept something brand new, even if it contradicts our previous ideas about what the truth, love, and justice of God must be. So how do we know God's will for certain? Well, we really can't, not for certain. God is frustratingly silent when it comes to providing proof and citations. God counts on us to listen and discern and be true to the ways that God has revealed God's self to us in the past and continues to do so in the present. But sometimes, even when we are faithfully listening, well, we, we miss here. Sometimes our own desire for the way things used to be or desire for the change that we want to see clouds our ability or our willingness to hear. I heard a story once about a minister who was performing a baptism for a young couple and when it came time to baptize the child and to say her name, he couldn't remember what it was. And so he leaned down to the father and whispered, what is this child's name? And the father said, Spendana. And the minister wasn't sure if he heard right, and he asked again, what is the name? It's Spendana, Spendana. So the minister baptized the infant girl, Spendana McKay, child of the cup. Afterwards, the father was very irritated and asked the minister why in the world he had not used the child's correct name during her baptism. The minister was confused until the father explained that it should have been very easy for the minister to simply read the child's name since it was very clearly written on a piece of paper that was pinned on her blanket. Her name was not Spindana, the name was pinned on her. Hey! I didn't do it. It was this other guy. <laughs> sometimes we don't hear. And sometimes we don't listen. And sometimes when we hear and listen, we groan because we don't like it anyway. <laughs> but committing ourselves to knowing God can help us to be more open to the ways in which God is trying to make God's self known to us every day. And sometimes we'll be right. And sometimes we won't. And sometimes we'll be somewhere in between. But the key is that we never stop struggling to understand. We never stop listening. We never stop trying to know who God is and what God is doing in our midst. The question of discernment is how do we know? And there really is no easy answer. Were it clear and easy and devoid of doubt and questions, we would not speak of the life of faith. We would speak of the life of certainty. But we read the Bible. We consider what we have learned about God and God's creation. We study and struggle and pray as Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, not our will, Lord, but your will be done. 
And in the end, we go on faith that we are living up to what God wants us to do and be when it's the way that we would have chosen and perhaps more importantly, even when it's not. To God be all glory, honor, power, and dominion in this world and in the world that is to come.